66 books in your Bible. They're written by dozens of different authors. They come from different points in history, different social and geographical regions. So the places don't seem familiar to us. The names often seem awkward to us. It's different types of literature. There's history and poetry and wisdom literature, all different things. Well, we'll do some work together to help you um, flourish as you're reading through it, if you'll make the commitment to read it with us. We started this year with the Gospels, those first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they tell the story of Jesus from four different perspectives. Mark is the oldest, the first of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Scholars think had, had, were familiar with Mark before they wrote their texts. Matthew and Luke share some different stories, but the core of the story is the same. So we get a broader perspective from the four Gospels. It's a great way to begin reading. If you've been doing the Bible plan with us this year, you know we're just beginning the Gospel of John. If you haven't been reading, come on, it'll help you. It will help you. I have an objective in this series intentionally to push you, if I can, off of neutral. I love you. But I want to do the best I can to kick the props out from under the excuses. Why aren't we reading our Bible? Well, it's difficult. Okay, it's difficult. Let's read it anyway. We do difficult things all the time. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. I understand that most of us have approached our Bible like a two-day diet. I mean, we are focused. We are into it. We're going to change how we appear for two days. Day three, I look at the mirror. Nothing's changed. I'm going to Dairy Queen. I'm going to give me a supersized blizzard and sort this thing out. And we tend to do that with our Bible. We read it a couple of days. We think, well, you know, I'm not any different. I don't know about that. It's going to take a little more effort than that. But what you really got to decide is what you believe. If you believe it'll change you, if you believe it's true. Again, I, I, we got to leave neutral, folks. Maybe it is. Maybe you got to make a decision. Let's get in or let's get out. Stakes are high. The opportunities are enormous, and God's given us help. So what I want to do with you this week is take the Gospel of Luke and, and simply unpack it in some ways. We just finished reading it, if you've been doing the reading. So you, you've got it kind of tucked under your belt. You're familiar with it. But in, in my opinion, it, it's not just reading the literature. Sometimes you can turn your brain off and read, and you don't get much benefit. But there's a story being told. Read it like you would pick up anything else. What's the story? Don't be content with just a fragment here and a fragment there. Ask yourself, what's the story? And I just want to walk through some portions of Luke with you and see if I can highlight that a little bit so that as you begin John, you can read with a different kind of awareness. Luke chapter 2, it's a birth announcement. Big surprise, Luke's going to tell us about Jesus. Luke chapter 1, he's, there's an angel that goes to Nazareth and says to a young woman named Mary, you're going to have a baby. And Mary says, no, I think you got the wrong address. I haven't been involved in the behaviors that make that a possibility. And the angel said, no, I got the right address. This is supernatural. So from the very, very first chapter of Luke, we understand that the Jesus story is unique. There's never been anybody else like him. The virgin birth is not a common concept. Fair enough. And it's, a, it's an establishing principle at the beginning of the Jesus story. He's not like everybody else. Because the outcome of his life is not going to be like everybody else. And you don't want to just gloss over that. you got to make a decision about it. Do you believe that story? Because if it isn't true, Jesus is a liar and a charlatan. Luke is telling you something. And he's inviting the re reader to believe something or to reject something. But it requires of us a decision. And then in Luke chapter 2, there's this remarkable announcement made. So there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. It's nearby Bethlehem. It's the city where Mary and Joseph have gone and she's going to give birth. Keeping watch over their flocks at night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, I suspect that's a passage familiar to most of us. You, you probably learned it from Charlie Brown. You've got to learn it where you can. Or maybe you've seen it on a Christmas card. It's a remarkable announcement. I think it's noteworthy the announcement is made to shepherds. Um, first century shepherds were on the fringe of society. They were an underclass. They weren't even given standing in a court. They couldn't testify in a public arena. They were considered to be so marginal 
that they wouldn't take their testimony as being authoritative. So I don't believe it's an accident that when God gets ready to announce the birth of his son in the world, he makes the announcement to shepherds, to the group of people who are considered untrustworthy. Makes me smile. God has a habit of re redeeming those that we think are beyond redemption. That's how I got in the game. And, and you. <laughs> And the angels, there's an angel that makes an announcement. It says, it's in verse, uh, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, again, the words are familiar to you, but folks, the drama of this is escalating the story that Luke is telling. I've seen lots of birth announcements, wedding announcements, lots of, I've never had an angel show up and the whole field be illuminated by the glory of God. And Luke is establishing something for you and for me as we read the story. This is not business as usual. What's to come you should pay attention to because the entrance of this person into the realm of humanity is most remarkable. See, the Gospels were intended to be an announcement. They were intended to be read publicly, orally. In the same way you would send a, a crier with a message from town to town or village to village, the idea was the Gospels were an announcement about Jesus, how he came into our world, who he was, what he accomplished for us. And that's what Luke is telling us and what John is getting ready to tell you as you read that. This is a remarkable story. Today in the town of David, the Messiah has been born. And that's not just an announcement, that's not an email blast. It's not a group text. It wasn't something they penned or a picture on Instagram. An angel announced it. Now Luke doesn't stop there. In Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 1, the angel goes to Mary. Luke chapter 2, there's a birth announcement. Luke chapter 3, we've stepped forward 30 years. Jesus is an adult and he's gone to be baptized. So this isn't a chronological telling of his story. It's not a day-by-day -day journal. We're 30 years later and they're going to be baptized. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. Now John baptized hundreds of people, powerful people, poor people, people from Jerusalem, all over the region. Jesus comes to be baptized. Something unique happens that day and Luke tells us about it. As Jesus was baptized, the heavens were opened. The, the, a dove, the Holy Spirit, descended upon Jesus. And there was a voice from the sky that said, this is my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. This isn't a birth announcement. We're 30 years later. And God the Father says, I am pleased with my son. Parents, if you've got 30-year-olds, you're just saying, I'm glad they're out of the house. Now, again, this is chapter three. Luke is establishing something for us. The circumstances of his birth are unique. The announcement of his birth is unique. His, his, as an adult, his step onto the public stage is affirmed by Almighty God. So everything that's coming after this has the supernatural affirmation, attestation of the creator of all things. The intent is to elevate Jesus in our eyes. We've tried to make him one of us. Now it's true he had an earth suit and he was subject to all of the weaknesses and the frailties that come with being a human being. But he came to show us something else. He came to show us something else. Look in Luke 4. It says Jesus went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. It's the village where he grew up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed him. He unrolled it. He found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. And to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And then he said, when he rolls up the scroll and he gives it back, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue are on him. And he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Synagogue attendance was like church attendance. They went each Sabbath and they read a scripture portion every time they attended. On this particular day, they hand Jesus the scroll. He finds Isaiah 61. 
and he reads what the prophet wrote. And when he's done reading, he said, today, this is fulfilled in front of you. You know what they said next? I didn't put it in your notes. We didn't have enough space. They said, isn't that Joe's boy? Don't we know Mary, his mom? Didn't our kids, weren't our kids on the same soccer team? I'm sure that's him. We had him for lunch. Who does he think he is? And they began to ask him questions. And before the discussion is done, in Nazareth, they were so angry with Jesus that they intended to kill him, to throw him off a cliff. Now Luke's helping us with something. In his hometown, when he just reads the scripture, Jesus becomes a line of demarcation. You know, that's not just a first century thing. He still is. When you decide to be an advocate for Jesus, when you decide to say you believe the word of God is authoritative and true, it becomes a line of decision. And not everybody will cheer for you. Remember, Luke put this story together years after it happened. Jesus has returned to heaven and Luke has researched the Jesus story and he's telling it to us. And it's helpful to us to remember, because I think we want to imagine if there was a miracle worker or somebody that could, could pray for the sick and they would get well, that there would be a, a universal acceptance of that. Folks, that isn't true. It wasn't true in the first century when Jesus himself was here. And it, it's not true in the 21st century. You and I have to decide what we're going to do. I don't intend to be a private advocate for Jesus. I'm all in. Haven't always been there. It wasn't always easy for me, so I understand. But I'm encouraging you to step out into the light and let the people that know you say, I am for Jesus. The church is stumbling on this one right now. Church with a big C. Well, what if we offend somebody? We want to show the love of God to everybody. I'm up for that. I don't want you to be belittling or demeaning or critical, but I want you to own the truth about Jesus as you know it. I don't know why when it comes to our faith that we lose our courage. If you're an advocate for the University of Tennessee, you put on the orange and white and you're proud of it and you really don't care who it chaps off. Is that fair? If you're an advocate for Alabama, we... <laughs> We just pray about you. <laughs> if you're an advocate for Vanderbilt, bless her to the poor in spirit, for they will be comforted. <laughs> I want to be an advocate for Jesus. I don't intend to back up, take my foot off the gas. But then I don't think we should be surprised when everybody doesn't cheer. It's okay. I know who it is I'm trying to please. All right. Let's go to Luke 24. We're going to get more messengers. We're at the other end of Jesus' life. We started with Luke and the birth narratives. And by the end of the gospel, we're around Jesus' betrayal and crucifixion and resurrection. On the first day of the week, it's the first day after the Sabbath. It would be Sunday. Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, the last time Luke had angels speaking to us, we were getting birth announcements and, and significant information. The angels are back. And it says of the women in their fright, they bowed down with their faces to the ground. Clever girls. There, there's something we've learned when the, when the angel appeared to the shepherds, the first thing the angel said was, don't be afraid. When these angels appeared to the women that have gone to the tomb, it says they were frightened. It's pretty frightening to be reminded that spiritual things are real. And one of the real tug of wars in our heart is with this notion that spiritual things are as real as the physical world we live in. It's not either or, folks, it's both and. That doesn't make you goofy or intellectually challenged. You believe in lots of things you can't see. You believe in gravity. You believe in a virus. Why would you not believe in spiritual things? We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. 
you'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. Uh, Luke is the one who tells us about the Good Samaritan. You all, pro you, pro you, you all probably know that the story or the idea of being a Good Samaritan, even if you didn't know it came from Luke. The prodigal son comes from Luke. You know what it means to be a prodigal, even if you didn't know we borrowed the idea from Luke's gospel. Well, I don't think that those distinctive parts of Luke are just random. I think Luke was trying to help the reader become a more effective disciple of Jesus. So when you recognize those distinctive things, you kind of set them apart and look at them and go, what are the ideas he's teaching us or helping us to understand? And I pulled two or three. We can't look at them all, but let's take a couple of them. In Luke 19 is the story of Zacchaeus. It's unique to Luke's gospel. Do you remember Zacchaeus? He's a tax collector and a thief. Do you remember where he lived? It's not a trick question. Jericho. Jericho is one of the oldest inhabited cities on planet Earth. It's at an oasis on the northern end of the Dead Sea, which means it's at the bottom of the Rift Valley. It's the lowest place on Earth below sea level plain language, that means it's really, really hot in Jericho. I've been there when it was north of 115 degrees. People say it's a dry heat. So's an oven, Obi-Wan. <laughs> I mean, it's a miserable hot place. And by this point in the story, it's near the end of Jesus' public ministry. He's he has a reputation. There's a crowd of people that are traveling with him. He's on his way up to Jerusalem and you get to Jericho and you take a right turn. You climb 18 miles up to Jerusalem. And when he comes into town, he sees Zacchaeus in a tree and he says, I'll go home with you today. Now Zacchaeus is the biggest sinner in the town. Everybody knows he's a thief and a liar, that he's lived in luxury at the sacrifice of his fellow citizens who he has betrayed to the Romans. He's a tax collector. And Jesus says, I'll go home with you, Zacchaeus. And the, the, the good people in the city are ticked off. Makes them mad at Jesus. After all, I'm quite certain the women of the church have prepared lunch. They have little jello cubes. <laughs> and now Jesus is going to be late and jello melts in a hurry in Jericho. <laughs> and Jesus goes home with Zach. And you've got the outcome in your story. It's Luke, Luke 19. The people saw this and they began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Now remember, Luke is telling us something. He's not just reciting history. He's told us about Zacchaeus. He's given us the circumstances. And now Zacchaeus is standing and saying, I'll give half of everything I have to the poor. And I'll reimburse four times over whatever I have stolen. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. He took the worst person in town, the most notorious, the most public, the most vile, the most hated. And he said, he is redeemable. You know, he's still saying that, that we are redeemable. You don't have to spend your life hiding the junk of your story from God. He knows it, folks. And if you will turn your face to him, the Zacchaeus story is a story about repentance and change and renouncing a way of life so that you can have a different way of life. It's a wonderful invitation. And then, then Luke puts it in a larger context. Jesus said, for I have come to seek and to save those which are lost. I haven't come just to hang out with the people that already love me. I've come to reach out to the people that you think are beyond the redemption. What a wonderful assignment. We have a story for the broken, desperate people because we have been broken, desperate people. Hallelujah. But I don't want us to miss it. I don't, I don't like to read my Bible just as an assimilation of facts. If I wanted to do that, I would have stayed in the university. The schedule is more manageable. 
The purpose of Scripture is to invite us towards transformation. And I want to take just a minute with that. Repentance means to change. It means to change our thoughts and to change our course. So there's both a, an inside and an outside component to repentance. Zacchaeus changed his mind, but it was demonstrated in his external behaviors. And repentance is a powerful, powerful tool in your life. All of us face temptations. Some of us yield to temptations. Some of us choose ungodliness. All sorts of ways. Some of it's our thoughts. It doesn't even have to be something you act on. You can take a thought and entertain it. It can take you to a bad place. It becomes a soulish thing in you. We want to repent, turn away from it. Lord, I'm sorry. Here's the good news. The Bible says that if we will repent, God is faithful and just to cleanse us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. You can be clean. That's Luke's story. Isn't that good news? You can be clean, folks. You don't have to lie about it, hide it, deny it, excuse it, justify it, blame it on somebody else. You can be free. Hallelujah. But there's another component. Sometimes when you have engaged in those behaviors, either intentionally or you were pulled into expressions of evil because you didn't have the ability, the maturity, the strength, the, the wisdom to stick to stay away. You know, evil affects children. Say, that's not fair. I know it's why it's evil. If evil played fair, we wouldn't call it evil. We would call it fair. Evil exploits vulnerabilities. I can think of lots of examples. Children, if, if, they're, if they're in the midst of a family and a divorce occurs. I'm not here to bang on that. God redeems that in our lives but it puts children in a vulnerable place. I, I've interacted with too many people. They, they, they intuitively feel as if somehow they've caused it or contributed to it. If they could have done something else or said something or been different or made less noise. And so they carry a burden. Evil will exploit that. Or the rejection that comes with a divorce. It's unavoidable. It, it's, it's about a separation. And, and kids will process that. Rejection, and, and they will have a, they will leave them with that sense. It, it's, it's a filter through which they see the whole world. So this is beyond just repentance. You can repent of your sin, but there's another step where we renounce any impact that that behavior may have had on my life, any influence that's come to me because I was in the, in the midst of something that was ungodly. I want to renounce it so that it has no place in me, no power over me in the name of Jesus. I have a mental picture of that. Forgiveness, you can be washed clean on the inside. But when you renounce something, it's as if something was put on you. It's not a part of you. It doesn't belong to you. you weren't, I wasn't created with a jacket on. Hallelujah. And when I renounce that and say, in Jesus' name, you have no place in me, no power over me, that thing, that filter that has covered you and been, been hung over you, you get free of it. It's gone in Jesus' name. I usually take better care of my clothes. <laughs> and Zacchaeus opens that up. Luke shows him to us. And he said, look, he was the most vile, hated, ungodly, unremorseful. He had no problem extorting money and bringing hardship. He changed. And he renounced his other way of life. And he stepped into a new kind of a life. We can do that. We can do that. I want to say a prayer with you. It's not the one you've got in your notes. I just want to lead you in a prayer. You can repeat it with me if you'd like to. We're going to repent of any sin that we have tolerated, excused, covered, denied, blamed on somebody else. Maybe it's a sin of indifference. It doesn't always have to be something overt. Don't be like the man that said, I'm better than my neighbor. We're going to repent and then we're going to renounce any impact from ungodly behavior, our own or when we were in the proximity. And we're going to get free. Amen. Hallelujah. Why don't you just bow your heads? Close your eyes. Forget the person beside you for a minute. Let's just say this prayer together. Heavenly Father, we come this morning in humility. 
to repent of our sin. Forgive me. Forgive me for my rebellion, for my stubborn refusal to cooperate with you. I choose a new path today. I want to yield to you. I want to honor you. I want to give you first place in my whole life. In all that I do, in all that I think, I want to honor Jesus. And I thank you now that I'm forgiven, that I've been cleansed, that you love me and you're pleased with me. And I renounce any unclean thing, any wicked spirit, any demonic influence that has attached itself to my life. In Jesus' name, I break your power over me. I'm a child of God. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. You have no authority to me, no power over me, no influence over me. In Jesus' name, I am free through the blood of Jesus. I have been delivered from the hand of the enemy. I'm a child of the King with a future defined by the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.